quiet strategy. Campaigning in the heartland, Democrat Hillary Clinton avoids the tough questions. Loving community. Honors for the founder of the L'Arche Movement, helping people who are intellectually challenged. St. Teresa of Calcutta. Rumblings grow louder about a possible canonization during the Jubilee Year of Mercy. And meet the Piano Man. From piano player to piano maker, Warren Shad builds and performs. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, May 19th, 2015. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Hillary Clinton insists she wants thousands of emails from her time as Secretary of State released as soon as possible. After dodging reporters, the Democratic presidential candidate finally talks with the media today. Suzanne LaFranchi is here with more tonight. Well, Hillary Clinton has been avoiding the press uh, quite artfully, Brian, for the last month, and it's been nearly a month since Clinton has talked to the media. Today she finally took questions, but she stuck to her talking points. Clinton defended her family foundation, saying she was proud of the initiative. At a bike shop in Cedar Falls, Iowa, Clinton stuck to her strategy today, stay on message. I want to make the words middle class mean something again. But her middle class message is getting scrutiny. Last week it was disclosed that she and former President Bill Clinton earned more than $30 million since January 2014. She's largely about ambition and power and about Hillary Clinton. Daniel Halper wrote Clinton Inc., a book focusing on the Clintons' ability to build a political machine. Their nonprofit, the Clinton Global Initiative, has raised more than $2 billion. Bill Clinton has given some defending the foundation. Chelsea Clinton has given a, an interview defending the foundation. Hillary, nowhere to be seen. That doesn't show leadership, and that's going to be, hurt her. Clinton is also facing heat over donations from foreign governments to the Clinton Foundation. They're covered by their own corruption. Everybody expects the Clintons to be corrupt, and therefore nobody's surprised to find allegations that they are corrupt. Last week it was reported that ABC News chief anchor George Stephanopoulos failed to disclose that he donated $75,000 to the Clinton Foundation. The former White House aide under Bill Clinton apologized, but the disclosure calls his credibility into question and highlights his connection to the family. Meanwhile, this afternoon, Clinton defended her appeal to middle-class voters. Well, obviously, Bill and I have been blessed, um, and uh, we're very grateful for the opportunities that we had, uh, but we've never forgotten where we came from. Clinton also told reporters nobody has a bigger interest in getting the emails out more than she does. This afternoon, a federal judge gave the State Department a week to create a schedule for releasing Clinton's correspondence. Brian? Suzanne LaFranchi, thank you. And some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Police now say the deadly shootout in Texas began with a fight over parking and someone running over the foot of a biker gang member. Texas authorities warned weeks ago of growing problems between rival motorcycle gangs. Sunday's shootout left nine gang members dead and 18 injured. About 170 are now charged with engaging in organized crime. After last week's deadly derailment in Philadelphia, unions want Amtrak to put two engineers on trains. A second crew member hasn't been required in the lead engine since 1983. Brandon Bastian was the lone engineer when train 188 derailed, killing eight people and injuring about 200. Investigators still don't know why the train was traveling at more than twice the speed limit entering a curve. Iraqi forces hold off Islamic State militants in an overnight attack near Ramadi, the city now held by ISIS. Meanwhile, ISIS released this video showing supporters in Mosul celebrating the militants' takeover of Ramadi. An Iraqi military official says 28 soldiers were rescued from the city on Monday. Roughly 500 civilians and soldiers were reportedly killed since the ISIS takeover on Friday. The White House calls it a setback, but to congressional leadership, the fall of Ramadi is deeply concerning. Uh, when, a, when a major city in Iraq, Ramadi, gets overrun uh, by ISIL, and the administration says, well, it's just a temporary setback, it's 70 miles from Baghdad. It's time to, for the president to get serious about this threat uh, to uh, Americans and our allies all around the world. The White House maintains, in spite of the setback, the campaign will ultimately bring victory. As Italian bishops gather in Rome for their annual meeting, Pope Francis, the Bishop of Rome, urges them to be more Christ-like. 
non essere timidi o irrilevanti nello sconfessare. The Holy Father telling the bishops not to shy away from denouncing the diffuse mentality of public and private corruption. Italy is rife with corruption scandals and 43% of the young people there are unemployed. Our Vatican correspondent Alan Holdren joining us from Rome. Alan, the Pope talking tough to the Italian bishops. Why is his message significant for the rest of the church? Well, really, Brian, when he was speaking to the Italian bishops yesterday, he spoke about his vision for what a bishop should be. It really applies to, to bishops all over the world. He said that bishops should not be micromanagers. They shouldn't be what he called pilot bishops, bishop pilots. Uh, he said that they should, they should go down into the trenches with the, uh, the faithful, accompany them in their hopes and their fears, their concerns. And he asked that they accompany faithful and form them to be active themselves, the laity themselves, in the public sphere. This is something that's, uh, that's really uh, applicable to any, any society, any bishop on earth. Alan, it's significant that you're standing in front of the Missionaries of Charity Soup Kitchen, Mother Teresa's uh, ministry there in Rome. We hear rumblings that she may be canonized during the Jubilee year of mercy. What are you hearing? That's exactly what we're hearing here in Rome at this point. Uh, it's, it's just a, a rumor, but it's gathering steam. I ran into an Italian cardinal this afternoon who told me that he was at the meeting yesterday with the Pope, where uh, the Pope spoke with the heads of, of the different departments in the Vatican. One of them proposed the idea of, during the Jubilee of Mercy, of canonizing Mother Teresa. Now, this would be a major step. This would make her a saint. She would be recognized officially as what a lot of people, including these, uh, these sisters uh, who work here behind me, already feel for her. Uh, I spoke with the Vatican spokesman, the Pope spokesman today. He said that this is just a hypothesis right now, but it is a possible hypothesis. We'll see about that. Our Rome correspondent, Alan Holdren, we always appreciate you keeping us posted on what's going on there. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. You're welcome. Some conservative leaders launched their own push for immigration reform today. Members of Congress and pro-life activists serving on a panel today say the American immigration system is dysfunctional. They say their five-point plan will serve as a blueprint for Congress to finally pass immigration reform. So we have with us Terry Schilling with American Principles in Action and Lila Rose of Live Action. So Terry, in a nutshell, what are the five points in this plan? So the first thing that we have to do is secure the border. Second is we need to implement E-Verify in the workplace. Third is we need to uh, establish an exit and entry registry system for the temporary visas. Four, uh, we need to expand the guest worker program. And five, we need to establish a path to legal status and not a path to, uh, special path to citizenship. And Lila, live action isn't necessarily endorsing this plan just yet, but you did speak at the presentation today. You normally are on life issues. Mm -hmm. What's the connection with immigration? So again, there's a lot of debate about what the right solution is, and we're not endorsing any solution, but we are saying that there is a problem. There's a problem, for instance, with sex trafficking over our border, both domestically and importing girls, young women into the country. We've been documenting and following that for years at Live Action, and its connection to the abortion industry. So the Department of Justice and others say that there's up to 18,000 trafficked into the country to be work slaves, a lot of them sex slaves. What happens to these women if you follow their lives? There's often a history, a horrible history, of forced abortions along with the sexual slavery that they endure. The other aspect of this that needs to be on the table during these immigration discussions, regardless of where you stand on the issue, what solution you promote, propose, is that one out of every six abortions is on an immigrant, either undocumented or brought here legally. That needs to be part of the discussion and part of the, the search for solutions. Very troubling, but thank God somebody like you is, is bringing this to the attention before they draft an immigration reform plan. Uh, these dreamers, kids that have been brought here by their parents, does your plan address this? Actually, it does. Uh, what our plan does is it it doesn't offer a special pathway to citizenship for dreamers, but what it does do is it offers them a path to legal status. And what that basically means is that they can come out of the shadows where they currently are at um, and, and they can actually get to the back of the line. Um, uh, it, it's fair to, to, to people that have done it the right way and it's also fair to, to those, uh, those dreamers. That's an interesting approach. So the cornerstone of this is really secure borders. That's the first point in the plan. I wonder what human rights issues are 
uh, you know, facing those on the borders right now? I know you mentioned some already, but really this is a key, isn't it, to getting something like this to go? I think so. I mean, when you approach the immigration issue, you have to look at sex trafficking, you have to look at the plight of those victims, and you have to look at the groups that are claiming to have a seat at the table in discussions about the, the solutions to the issue of immigration in our country. Some of those people are groups like the abortion industry. Planned Parenthood is talk constantly talking about their ideas connected to immigration. They want tax dollars to fund abortions for undocumented immigrants, which is an insult to undocumented immigrants, an insult to women. They should not be trusted. So we need to actually look at these other aspects of the problem as we search for the solutions. And the U.S. Catholic bishops have been very vocal about immigration reform. Have they had a chance to review your plan yet? Have you had any feedback? Not yet, but we do plan to get them a copy of the plan, and we also plan to uh, bring this to members of Congress and senators over the next coming weeks. Well, we appreciate you laying it out for us and giving us a lot of the, the other uh, aspects of what this could lead to. Terry Schilling with American Principles in Action. And from Live Action, Lila Rose, thank you both for being with us. Thanks, Brian. Brian. Well, this year's prestigious Templeton Prize goes to Jean Vanier, the founder of L'Arche. That is a network of communities where people with and without intellectual disabilities live and work together. Jason Calvi explores Vanier's impact here in D.C. Housemates at a large community in D.C. relax after work. It's one of 147 houses across the world. This is where I love to live. Back in 2002, Eileen Schofield met the founder of L'Arche, Jean Vanier, who's now 86. What did you say to him? I said, you're my best friend. Vanier started L'Arche in 1964 when he invited two people with intellectual disabilities to live with him. For Eileen, it feels personal. He made L'Arche just for me. And Jean Vanier's legacy lives on in more than 30 books that he's written, including his most famous work, Community and Growth. Whenever I read his words, I feel like some part of me is being quenched that I didn't know was thirsty. Kara Olenek joined L'Arche two years ago after reading that book by Vanier. He often uses the word encounter as his focal word. For me, that's so true. It's an encounter the first day I arrived. Where are you going? Around. Around. <laughs> an encounter when Endeavor decides she's going to make a cameo. John Vanier's impact on this community is big, as residents and visitors share their joys, meals, and prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for everything you do. In Washington, Jason Calvi. Amen. EWTN News Nightly. Amen. Coming up, Republican presidential hopefuls question. fight for attention in an already crowded field. And a digital collection plate targets younger parishioners in the Archdiocese of San Francisco. God is always waiting for us. He always understands us. He always forgives us. A message from Pope Francis on his Twitter account for today. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul cautions against the use of, or the U.S. pattern of taking down foreign dictators. The Republican presidential hopeful says without a solid plan for stabilizing those nations, it's been a disaster. I think really every time we've toppled a secular dictator in the Middle East, we've gotten something worse and something less stable. Meanwhile, Paul vows to do everything possible to block renewal of the Patriot Act, but concedes it may not be enough. Though he has yet to announce, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker sounds very much like a candidate for president. People want both a fighter and someone who's a winner, someone who's fought the good fights and won those fights. There's a lot of good people who fought big battles here in Washington but haven't won much out of it. Walker making those comments in Washington today. He fought organized labor in Wisconsin, not only winning that battle, but also a recall election after deunionizing state workers. The Archdiocese of San Francisco backs a new app referred to as a digital collection plate. The EverGive app allows parishioners to donate to their church with the click of a button. The San Francisco Archdiocese launched it this weekend, acknowledging that many young parishioners don't even have a checkbook anymore. Catherine Zeltner spoke with the creator of EverGive about the app's giving and community focus. James, EverGive is being touted as a mobile fundraising app, but it seems to have more than that. What exactly is EverGive? So Catherine, you're absolutely right. It is a lot more than a mobile fundraising app. 
Uh, we're building here are tools that help amplify the impact of mission-driven organizations like the Catholic Church. And when I think about contributing to the church, I think about contributing gifts of time, talent, and treasure. And Evergive is really about making it easy to contribute all of those things. Um, I think one of the biggest benefits of our technology is the ability for parishioners to stay connected with the church 24-7. But don't you think parishioners will be turning to their smartphone screens instead of turning to each other in the church community? So Evergive was never meant to to replace the existing interactions. We're here to complement those interactions. And we really see the highest engagement uh, Monday through Saturday when most parishioners aren't typically at, at church. And I'd love to share a great example of a, a use case from a parish down here in San Jose. We had a parishioner who had a sick child and they posted out to the app and, and connected with their parish community requesting prayers for that child. And within a couple minutes, they had a number of comments on that post, a number of parishioners helping pray for the child. They continued to update uh, the parish throughout the child's sickness. And we like to think it worked because the child did get better. So, James, in your opinion, what place does technology have in the church? So I don't think anyone knows the exact answer to that question. But what we do know is that there's a general shift uh, from the physical to the digital, to the extent where we actually see people walking down the street and running into poles because they're so engaged with their smartphone. And so what's clear is that the church does need a presence there in order for it to stay top of mind every day, as it should, uh, it, it needs a digital presence. And that's what we're here doing at Evergive is helping work with our partners and especially our earlier partners, understand how can we build technology that supports you? What are the tools you need? How are parishioners engaging with this? And I think the most important thing as we think about building technology for the church is really how can we engage the parishioners? How can we build something that the parishioners want as well as the church administration? It's all about building that connection and, and keeping the church top of mind. James Ioannidis, thanks for speaking with us today. Happy to be here. All right, James and Catherine, thank you. Well, you could say Pope Francis is an answer to the prayers of a Bosnian man. Marine Vitkovic is a mailman and pigeon breeder. When the 39-year-old Catholic heard about the Pope's June visit to Bosnia, he offered some of his pigeons to help deliver Francis's message. The Pope will release three of Marine's white pigeons into the Bosnian sky. It is a gesture to spread the Pope's blessing over the troubled country and its three ethnic groups. When I got the call that everything was approved and agreed upon, I was so excited. I could not sleep for two days. Pope Francis will celebrate Mass in Sarajevo June 6. It is the third papal visit to Bosnia since 100,000 died in a war between Muslim Bosniaks, Christian Orthodox Serbs, and Catholic Croats. Up next, some American communities show an alarming rate of missing men. And we meet a man who not only plays piano, he actually builds them. Tuesday, May 19th. Thank you for joining us for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. A recent New York Times article shows there are 1.5 million black men missing from everyday life across the United States. They're missing because they die young or they are incarcerated. This article shows that for cities with sizable black populations, Ferguson, Missouri has the highest rate of missing men, 40 for every 100 women. And North Charleston, South Carolina, has a rate higher than three quarters of the nation. For every 100 women, there are 25 missing men. It's great to have Damon Owens back with us. He's executive director of the Theology of the Body Institute, Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Damon, why are these statistics so alarming, especially for black families? Uh, a lot of these questions related to sociological impact uh, really are what we call long arc problems, where we understand the structure of the family. You don't, it's not just a matter of belief or assent of being Christian or looking at the moral law. Sociologists know the power of the intact family, specifically a child that's raised by a mother and a father uh, in, in an environment where they can nourish and flourish. And what we're seeing in this article particularly is uh, the, the recognition that over a long arc, changes, effects, uh, whether they're slow or, or abrupt, in that family unit and that structure 
have a profound impact that may not be measurable in the first year, the first five years, the first 10 years, but they will show. And what we teach in the theology of the body about the meaning of masculinity, femininity, uh, the union of the two in marriage that becomes a, a willful uh, environment to build the family and to raise what takes decades of formation of the human person, uh, that's not negotiable. And this study of statistics since 1965 just proves the case that in this, in the African American community, that that destruction of the uh, the family has impact on the culture. And how can we turn that around to where the family actually plays a key role in breaking this cycle? Yeah, this is not a government program. And in fact, uh, the Senate could look and say that this government programs that try to replace what the family is really become uh, uh, the problems in and of themselves. So this is a this is a, a human problem. This is about human formation. It's community. But in first and foremost, it is it is a faith based answer. So as believers, as Christians, first and foremost, we have to live what we believe, even imperfectly. And we also have to recognize that our, our responsibilities go beyond uh, our immediate families to our extended families and to the communities and to the church at large. So I think this fits squarely into uh, the Christian gospel, the evangelization, not looking for a government solution to be imposed from the outside, but really living the truth and the fullness of who we are made in the image and likeness of God in our own families so that we can be that, uh, that model, that haven and also that place where uh, the fully formed human person can shine before the culture. The executive director of the Theology of the Body Institute, Damon Owens. Thanks for joining us, Damon. Always great to see you, Brian. Thank you. And thank God for St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body and leaders like Damon Owens. Well, for more than 100 years, names like Steinway and Baldwin dominated the piano industry. But these past 10 years, one piano man is gaining recognition. As Mark Irons reports tonight, he seems to be hitting all the right keys. He's a self-proclaimed child prodigy who became a professional drummer. But Warren Shad grew up around pianos. My father was a piano technician, rebuilder, uh, restorer of pianos. So I used to see all the pianos in the house, in the basement, in the warehouse, and I would uh, just toy with them, build them like, like model cars. Since 2002, Shad has been making a name for himself, not as a performer, but as a piano maker. One thing about the pianos here, they're very aesthetically pleasing. From the ornate look to design features and tone, the sounds of Shad are being heard. These pianos, though, they're going all over the world. Yeah, from New York to Australia. Even the Vatican wants one of his pianos. And the thing is, it's, it's replacing a brand that has been there for generations over and over again uh, and so for us to come in uh, as the little guys to replace the big guys you know is it, great. You know? Warren is a pioneer in his field. You're the only African-American manufacturer of pianos. Is That's that a, what they say. Is that a fact? <laughs> that is a fact actually. That is a fact um, and some would even say de facto musical instrument. The instrument he's most proud of? This interactive piano. It can assist deaf, blind, and autistic pianists. This is, this is my, my greatest accomplishment so far. Performer, designer, innovator, all packed in one name. Do you also offer lessons? Um. <laughs> in Maryland, Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Now there would be a challenge for Mr. Shedd. All right, thank you, Mark. We appreciate it. Until tomorrow, we encourage you to like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. If you'd like to watch again, you can go to EWTN's YouTube page. The EWTN News Nightly team is behind this great show every night. We appreciate their good work. I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you. <laughs>